Assad. Absolutely. It's either Assad or bloody chaos. So let's make it Assad. Some careers will have to be sacrificed. I'm sorry. That's where the, where the, the little boy floating in the surf comes in. Now, we can make this um, a bit more uh, specific. Today, King Salman of Saudi Arabia is visiting Obama at the White House. Just a couple of uh, atmospherics. Um, we have, for example, uh, an entourage of a thousand Saudi parasites, diplomats, hangers. I'm sure some of them are slaves, by the way. Some of them indeed are chattel slaves, and that, that ought to be seized. Uh, anybody smart would do that. So the, the media coverage is all, what is Salman going to be demanding from Obama? Does he want assurances on the Iran nuclear accord? Uh, and does he want other uh, concessions, uh, so forth? Our answer to that is, how about Saudi Arabia stopping their notorious support for terrorism? And it turns out that Salman is a former head of the Mujahideen Foundations in Saudi Arabia. These are the quasi-governmental, non-governmental Quangos, right? The Quangos, quasi uh, quasi-autonomous uh, non-governmental organizations, the Mujahideen foundations, the Muj get the big bucks from Salman's foundation. So that means he's a top terrorist controller. He was funding terrorism for these clerics, right, for the Wahhabites. Uh, we had an article by Thomas Friedman even on the 2nd of September, saying, you know, Iran is not really the biggest problem when it comes to terrorism. The Saudis themselves are a pretty big part of the problem with those Wahhabites and ISIS and everything that they like so well. Why don't we hear something about this? Now, uh, they are staying, the Thousand Parasites are staying at the Four Seasons Hotel over here in Georgetown. And we're told that even in this relatively um, well-appointed hotel, the furniture was not good enough, so the furniture had to be taken out and gilded furniture, gold leaf furniture had to be put in for this uh, degenerate monstrosity, King Salman, terrorist controller, and his entourage. We'll be back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. Webster Darby here in Washington, D.C. And uh, it's the uh, 4th of September. Now, uh, the idea is you're getting orchestrated news now. We're under a kind of um, pre-war censorship regime. So as the Iran stuff is pushed to the sidelines and the treaty is now completely off the table, they won't talk about the treaty because it's a loser. They got to talk about how bad Iran is, right? How ugly it is. This was this America abroad nonsense that we heard uh, today. They should they should take their program abroad and not come back. We also have Erdogan. Now, Erdogan gets the posture. Can you believe this? The head of ISIS, the guy who funds ISIS, gives the logistics. I mean, some of the money comes from Saudi, of course, but it goes through Erdogan's machine. I'm sure he skims. His, his son is involved. His daughter's involved. So now we have the poor little boy got killed, and we have Erdogan posturing posturing as a humanitarian, Mr. Isis, the true caliph. He says, quote, what has drowned in the Mediterranean is not only the refugees. Humanity has drowned in the Mediterranean Sea. Well, what I can see is um, why didn't you let these people, since you're letting terrorists go into Syria from all over the world, you're recruiting them. Why don't you let them travel on the normal land route, right? Get some buses or get, get your railroad system going and let them traverse Turkey and, um, and help them that way. So uh, what we see is uh, many Syrian refugees struggle to procure exit visas from Turkish authorities, meaning that the risky passage on rubber dinghies to nearby Greek islands is often their only route to Europe. Get it? Erdogan has set up a situation to maximize the deaths. The little boy, his blood is on the hands of Erdogan. 
And once we've said Erdogan, we can't forget his alter ego, John Allen, ISIS czar. So look at that chain of guilt and horror. And now this hypocrite, right? This this uh, Erdogan generally wins the the prize for impudence and hypocrisy. Uh, that's what he gets um, this week. So let's uh, let's take a look at some uh, other aspects of this situation. Uh, the the neocons are still mocking Obama for saying ISIS is the junior varsity. Well, here's what I say to that: ISIS is not even the junior varsity. ISIS is the intramural league, right, where one fraternity plays another. We used to call it interclub, right, interclub hockey or something like that. Uh, ISIS is inferior to the JV. The only reason they're still there is because of Allen, Erdogan, Turkish complicity and logistics and Saudi money. That's what it takes to have ISIS. And if you lean on those people, uh, this could be over. So what is Salman doing at the White House. How about getting the Saudis to stop being the money bags and financiers of this entire terrorist effort? Now, just on the um, inside question of the um, of the refugees, the answer to it is something like this. Take a look at what I've written this week. No more bombing. No more humanitarian bombing. No more Libya. No more Syria. Work with Assad. Work with existing governments. Take away all sanctions. Forget that. Uh, and then. It's going to take five trillion from the Federal Reserve and five trillion from the European Central Bank. That is the, the principal use of that money is to buy capital goods in Europe, in the United States, ship them on over. No money goes or very little. So don't worry about the money being stolen. It's going to be uh, all kinds of capital goods, locomotives and all the rest, modern energy production without ideological preclusions, preclusions. So that, all of that goes over. The estimate would be probably 5 million jobs in the US, 5 million jobs in Europe, but this is now reviving capital goods construction big time. And over there, probably uh, 30 million jobs, 30 million jobs in the Middle East at good uh, union wages, dare I say. Um, isn't that a whole lot cheaper than the alternative? Just the Iraq war, just the Iraq war, three trillion gone. So um, take a look at my my plan. It's a serious plan. Um, so uh, these refugees are coming from Syria. That's where the Saudis and the Turks send in the, the uh, terrorists. Libya, <clears throat> with Libya we had U.S. NATO terrorists, U.S. NATO bombing. Iraq, of course, bombed twice. Uh, sanctions for 10 years, my God, and another invasion. Lebanon, they come from. Um, South Sudan, South Sudan is a monstrosity. There's the, 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 that was a British plan from the 19th century. And Garang, right, the, head, the main rebel in Sudan was not in favor of splitting up the country. Eritrea, Ethiopia, and, and so forth, right? So you get the idea. Now, who's taking what? Germany, um, 800,000. It's respectable. U.S., 1,000. Pathetic. U.K., 200. Hungary, 278. Uh, how about this? Why not put some U.S. ships, including warships, but get some old passenger liners, put them in the med and let, and let them pick up these people so they don't die? Um, and as I say, you've got to realize immigrants are the lifeblood of your economic future because in most of the advanced countries, because of cultural pessimism primarily, but also economic privation, um, the demographic rates are uh, through, the, uh, through the, uh, the floor, right? In other words, they're, they're re these places are all shrinking in uh, their possibilities. If I were president, I would seriously consider putting U.S. ships into the eastern Mediterranean and picking up these people and say, the United States government is not going to let anybody die. And frankly, we don't care where they go. There are all kinds of places they can go uh, and do that. Because remember, those, those are – that's labor power. That's wealth. Humanity is wealth. People are wealth. So why can why look at this as a problem when it could be the source of your economic survival in the future? Obviously, you have to invest, but that's true of anybody. That's true of anybody born uh, in the country. So uh, we have uh, President Xi uh, arriving, somewhat chastened, right? Uh, 
The U.S., I think, has finally faced the fact that uh, the Chinese do hack. They hack like crazy. And that uh, some kind of gesture against this is uh, required. Uh, we're, one of the one of the uh, the new zingers here is that the the hack of the Office of Personnel Management (OPM) is the Pearl Harbor of data theft. Well, uh, we hope not. Um, so, we're also marking. We'll have something to say about this probably later in the show. This is now the uh, anniversary, the eighth uh, anniversary, of the famous Kenny Bunkport warning of August. 2007, and then of the rogue B-52, an attempt to start war by the invisible government faction speaking through Cheney. That was in September of 2007. And we've just been told an interesting thing. You remember a couple of uh, weeks ago, we had Netanyahu trying to start war with Iran on three separate occasions, once with U.S. forces in the country. I would say there better not be any more U.S. forces sent to Israel until that one is cleared up, and that ought to get him out of there. I wouldn't send any U.S. forces as long as Netanyahu is the, is the prime minister. But now uh, we have this thing that uh, in 2000. Uh, let's see. Looks like 2008, uh, at the end of Bush, uh, the Israelis turned to the United States and said, we want to bomb Iran, a uh, nuclear program, and we want the equipment to do it. And we're told th – this comes from a guy called Jim Jeffries. He's a reporter, anyway, who reported it, uh, saying that Cheney uh, – Cheney told uh, the, uh, the White House uh, counselors that he wanted to do it, but no, even Mad Dog Bush at that point is not prepared to go along. So, back in a minute on World Crisis Radio. Welcome back to a World Crisis Radio. Webster Topley here in Washington, D.C. Now, <clears throat> the uh, Greek situation continues to attract the attention of people who want to learn what to do when it becomes their turn in their country. So we're always interested in figuring out what went right, what went wrong, what to do, how to govern yourself accordingly. So we're in the middle now of an election campaign. The vote is going to be on Sunday, September 20th. Uh, so it's, going to, it's a short, intensive election campaign, and we are going to learn a lot. And to help us, we have Michael Chiotinis in Athens. Michael, welcome. Hello. Um, yes, exactly. We have an election September 20th. Um, now, the political atmosphere here is one of disappointment, uh, disillusionment, even despair, I could say. Um, the problem is, as you said, that one of the lessons, uh, this, is, this was the, the, most, the single most promising political project in recent history, um, and it has turned into a nightmare within eight months. Now, what is this? First, we need to say that this is a ticking time bomb, I think. Uh, we have no idea how it's going to explode. Um, and I'm talking here about undecided voters um, and a huge number of voters that won't bother to go and vote, you know. Um, what Tsipras has managed to do here is <laughs> capture not only the anti-austerity movement, uh, but the generally rising political mobilization of um, especially the youth. He captured this spirit of optimism and political renaissance, um, if I can say that, and he simply shattered it to pieces. And this is dangerous politically. Um, let alone economics. Politically, this is a, a, a disaster. I'm sorry, there's no other way to say this. Uh, now, Tsipras, for whatever reason, is uh, carrying out, I think, the, the creditor's plan, the German plan, Schäuble's plan. Because, let me ask one simple question. W what exactly is the purpose of this election? No one, no one would have challenged the government. Uh, he had the votes that he needed to pass legislation, be it with opposition votes, but 
uh, votes from the opposition, but he did have the votes. So what, what's the reason?